Jesus, change my whole life. Yes, you just who I am. thank you for the privilege of coming to your house of worship. We thank you, Father, for the strength to be able to call on your name. Father, I pray now in the name of Jesus that you would heal us where we're sick. I pray, Father, that you would give us direction to where we're heading the wrong way. Father, I pray now that you would continue to cover us with your protection. Father, would you change us where we are living in error? Father, would you continue to forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness? Lord, would you help us when we're walking with a confused mind? Help us, Lord when we have harbored hatred in our hearts. Father, would you help us that we would make honorable and wise decisions before you. Help us with our relationship with our fellow man. Teach us, Father, how to walk past hatred and dissension. Teach us, Lord, how to overcome strife and anger. Help us, Lord, that we might live a quiet and peaceful life. Teach us, O oh God, to walk in your freedoms and in the liberties that you have granted us. Help us, Lord Jesus, to stop being frustrated and be more understanding. Help us, Lord, I acknowledge that we're struggling. Father, forgive us for walking in ways that are not pleasing unto you. Forgive us, Lord, for turning to sin and looking for happiness when you are the giver of all of our joy. Help us, Lord Jesus, to learn how to stand and say, for God I live, and for God, I'm willing to die. But Lord, not only help us, but let us say thank you for not giving up on us when we gave up on ourselves. Thank you, Lord, for not turning your back on us when we walked away from you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for having an everlasting mercy and grace on our lives. Thank you, Lord, for not removing your salvation from us. We know that we're not worthy, but you are a good God. And you've promised to keep us 
in perfect peace. And Father, I can't close this prayer without thanking you for Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Savior of all the world. Thank you, Lord, for his precious blood that he shed for us on Calvary. Thank you, Lord, for being there for us when we just couldn't understand what was going on. Thank you for creating us in your likeness and in your image. And it's again in your son Jesus' name that I pray this prayer. And all God's children said together, amen. getting older but by the grace of God I'm getting better just for my testimony I thank God for what he's made me I can truly testify that every day with Jesus it's sweeter than the day before. I've been praying since before I can even remember. But it's getting to be now that the answers that he gives me, I'm more appreciative of. I used to pray and wonder if God heard me and wonder if he would answer. But I've lived some time now. I know that he'll answer. I know now that he loves me. And maybe you hadn't gotten there yet. But I found a friend I know that my Redeemer lives. I'm not proud of the life that I've lived, but I know that he's still proud of me. This ought to help you too. He knows that you hadn't done all you were supposed to do. But you walked in here today with another chance. You came in to worship a God that never changed his opinion of you. He said before you were ever created, I love you. And after you were created, you did what you were not supposed to do and you walked the ways that you were not supposed to walk. But his testimony is still true. He loves you. Maybe you just have to live a little longer. Those of you that have brought your Bibles with you, Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 13. And when Jesus entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, 
grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou should cometh under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, Go, and, the, and he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard, Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in that very same hour. I want us to take a look at faith from the unexpected. Faith from, an un, from the unexpected. To simplify this and give you a clearer definition of the subject today, I want to say faith in one that doesn't look like a church man. doesn't look like a church goer, but we're going to see some faith, because sometimes we fail to realize that faith is not determined by your location. Faith is sometimes de determined by your condition or your surroundings. You prove your faith. You don't just claim your faith. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing the word of God. And we have to learn to open our minds and understand that the word of God is not just something that you hear on Sundays at 1030. The word of God is living, breathing, walking, proving himself, omnipotent, omniscient, ever-flowing, and all-powerful, the Word of God is a 24-hour-a-day, 365-day-a-year living and breathing source of life. And we see here in the text, we see faith from the unexpected. Let me dive into the text and share something with you. We see that Jesus has come back to Capernaum a place where he frequented for worship and reading of the scriptures. Here we find that Jesus has pretty much come home. And when he gets home, I guess in anticipation of getting back to the church house after doing church work or church ministry, he runs into a centurion soldier. A centurion soldier is in his homeland, which was a fighter for the Romans. This man was not one that you would normally see in this place of Capernaum. He was a fighter for the Romans. He was not a Jew, as the people of Capernaum were. He was not a synagogue worshiper. He was a person really out of place. Now, when we read the text and learn from the text or learn the true understanding of the text, you would think that he may be a soldier that has been placed there or saying that a garrison had been placed in the place of Capernaum. 
but research has found and dictated that at that time there was no garrison in Capernaum. In other words, there was no fort set up where soldiers were to be that may have overtaken the city in some type of battle or war. So some suggest that this centurion soldier was a Gentile, meaning that he was one that were not of the Jewish faith and of the Jewish custom. And it's possible that he was a hired hand by one, Her uh, one Herodian who was Antipas. So he possibly was one who had a job. He was really a centurion soldier, which was one who was in charge. He was a commander of anywhere from 80 to 100 million. But here, maybe he had a side job because he was hired by Antipas. And now that made him not just a centurion, but also it made him considered to be a Gentile. Again, one who is not of the Jewish faith. But we see something in this Gentile man that shows that he was capable and willing to do what those who were of the Jewish faith and those who that were followers of Jesus. He was doing what they were supposedly supposed to be doing. And he showed himself that he recognized Jesus for who he was. He did not concern himself with who he was because the scripture describes this centurion soldier. It describes him as being one who had authority, one who had some say-so and some power in the city. It shows that he was one who also had some financial stability because it said that he had, he had servants. He had a servant that was sick with the palsy, trembling unto death and having a great anxiety. And to have servants, that means you also have to have some authority. He was a well-to-do person in the city of Capernaum. He was one that you could really look at and say, well, he's got everything going on. But yet and still, he still had a problem that he could not fix on his own. He had a sickness that was in his house among his servants. But really what catches us in the text is he had sickness in his house. But it, I, read, I don't read where he called on a doctor from the city. He didn't call on a, a witch doctor. He didn't call on the soothsayers, but he called on Jesus. That lets me know that this man was different from possibly you and I. Because I'm still looking at this man's life. This man here said, one writer says that Matthew says that he came to Jesus. But if you read this account in the other gospel of Luke, it says that he sent his servants to Jesus. Now, I don't know whether he came or he sent his servants or they all came together. All I know is he knew something about Jesus and how to get the message to him. And maybe your healing has come from somebody who went to Jesus or somebody who sent up a prayer to Jesus for you. But if you're sick with the palsy, which were tremors, which you had uncontrol of your hands and your, your limbs, you ought to be thankful that somebody got in contact with Jesus for you. And I know that this man ought to be rejoicing because he had a, a leader, a centurion soldier, a commander over him that didn't go to church on a regular basis. He was not one that frequented the church because, again, he was not Jew. He was not of the custom of the day. He didn't hang out in the synagogue. But he did know that it's possible to get in touch with Jesus. Amen. And that's why I say this faith is from the unexpected. Because you don't expect to see faith in someone that doesn't go to church every Sunday. You don't expect to see faith from somebody that's got it all together in the eyes of society. When one that doesn't come to church and he's got power, he's got authority, he's got prestige, rarely will that person ever come to church. But can I tell you something? Not everybody in the church is going to heaven. 
not everybody in the world is going to hell. There are some that may never step foot in this church house, but that doesn't mean that they don't have faith in God. And maybe I'm trying to help somebody that's not in here today because there are some people now that have been scarred from going to church and may never walk into another church house, but that doesn't mean that they don't have faith. There are some people that do things for the church that never come to the church house that God has honored and said, your faith has made you whole. Can I describe this person here today? There are some people that have been scarred at the church house that will never come back into a church house. And if truth be told, I am a church baby. Been in church for 50 plus years now. And there are some churches that I've been in that I ain't going back to. And I understand why some people don't come to church. Because they have been scarred by some activity that took place in the church house. And I'm not finna sit here and tell you that every church is a perfect place. And I can't truthfully tell you that you ought to go to the church even if it ain't right and you need to sit up in there anyway. I'm about at the point now that if it ain't right and it's not of God, you need to get out of there. And you need to get to a place where you can talk with Jesus and understand what's going on. It's gotten so bad now that Jesus is never mentioned nor seen in some church houses. And again, I can't rightfully tell you to stay there anyhow. I don't have no scripture to teach you that, and I don't have a mind to tell you that. But there are some reasons that some people will never come back to a church house. Some people have never been taught of how the church is supposed to operate. And those outside who have never been taught are hindered, about, hindered by coming in. I understand some out in the world that says that I know God. And I love God. And I believe in God. But because of what something that has happened to me in the church house, I won't be going back there. And I know some preachers and some pew members that might disagree with what I'm saying today. But I'm going to tell you something. God went out of the church more than he stayed in it. God went out. Jesus went out on his mission. And got people, and I'm going to stay with the text. If you don't believe what I'm saying, believe what the text is saying. Jesus told him that your faith is something that I've never seen. Even in Israel, who are my chosen people. He's saying to a Gentile that I see more faith in you than I've seen in some of my own children. But I'm here to tell you that some of us going to make it in, and some of us won't. But that's on you because I'm giving you a chance now to make Jesus your choice and stop sitting around in the church house and start standing up in the church house. Let me, let me move on down and stay with the text. The text teaches that the soldier called out and asked Jesus, would you heal my servant? And Jesus said, yeah, I'll do it. And you know God had to have some kind of love and favor over the life of this Gentile man. To never ask him, are you saved? Do you believe in me? Will you follow me always? The response was, I will come and heal him. That lets me know that there was a relationship that had already been established with this man. But then the text also teaches us that this man knew something about the church. And he did not hold it against the church. He just said, I'm not hanging out in the church. Because if you read the text in Matthew and Luke, it'll teach you that this man, the centurion, said that taught that I know about the church and I'm not against the church because I help pay for the church and build the church. You ought to read it over in Luke and Mark. You'll find out that this man that didn't frequent church, he put more in it than some people that sit in it every Sunday. And that's why I'm trying to tell you that there's some out there that you'll see up there when you get there. 
if that might be possible. Because this man showed that I'm not against it, and I'm still in favor of it. And I guess what I'm trying to teach you is I know that some people will take this message and say, that's why I don't go to church. And I sit on my couch and my stool of do nothing. And I listen to the preacher, but I ain't got to go in that place of worship. Well, no, you ain't got to come in this place of worship. But if you stayed at home and you never sending anybody to the kingdom, you're not the one that I'm talking about today. Because this one here says, I helped build the church. I gave to the church when it was time to organize your building. And I start sending folks to God when they needed healing and not to man or myself. I didn't try to pay for them a blessing. I tried to get them a blessing. And that's what I'm saying to the believer that's not in the church. I understand that you may not come here, but you ought to show some sign. And when you show that you still you can still love those who are in the church, even when they are not perfect, that's the one I'm talking about today. Because this one right here says, I ain't coming, but I'm sending my money, and I'm pledging my time, and I'm acknowledging God for who he is. So I'm letting you know that I'm not there physically, but spiritually we're on the same page. And I know this is way of cutting across the grain from a whole lot of preaching that we've heard. But can I tell you again, God has saved more out there than he has in here. Let me stay with the text. He says, to speak the word and speak it only, and my servant shall be healed. And he said, but listen to what the centurion soldier said. He said, Lord, I am a man unworthy, and I take, allow you in my house. Would you just speak the word and he'll be healed? But don't come to my house. Let me tell you about somebody like that. I love a man that goes on to tell the truth. Because the truth will set you free. He said, I love you, God. I believe in you, God. But I know I ain't living right. I know my house ain't what it's supposed to be. But I still know that you're God. And the only way it'll ever get right is when you clean it up. Because I'm unable to do it myself. I know how to make money. And I know how to be prestigious in the eyesights of man. But I ain't strong enough to clean up my bad act. But Lord, if you love me and you trust me, I mean, and you believe and you have faith and believe in me to be a better person, one day it'll get better. But right now, Lord, I just can't have you in my house because my house is raggedy. My house is not in order. But, Lord, I know that if you just speak a word from where you are, how many of us now can go on and tell the truth about it? I'd rather meet Jesus at church than to invite him to my house. Because when he comes to my house, he'll see some things that I just don't want him to see. He'll, see, he'll, he'll find out that I'm doing some stuff that I know and he knows that I shouldn't be doing. But don't trouble yourself because grace and mercy will cover all of that. God said, I'll turn away from sin on your behalf because I'll pay for that and I'll still look at your face and see that you're my child. But he says to him, don't come to my house. Just speak a word and heal this servant of mine. This, this centurion, this Gentile person was showing Israel that I, I, I know I ain't what you think I ought to be. But it doesn't matter what you think I am. It's what God says that I am. And we who are in the body of, the, of Christ, who are churchgoers, we need to learn how to quit getting mad at folks. Quit condemning folks for their condition. I know what the house look like. I don't want to go in it either. I know what your lifestyle is like, and I don't want to be a part of it either. But I don't want to condemn you because even though your life is bad, salvation is complete. This soldier said, I know I didn't earn my salvation. It was given to me. I know I didn't do what all y'all did. But he did enough. The centurion soldier said, don't come to my house. And he said, and, and, but I have power. I can go where I want to go. Yes, sir. 
I can speak to who I want to speak, and they're going to reverence me. But then the red letter writing of Jesus says, But verily I say unto you, I have not found so great a faith, no, not in Israel. Jesus went back to his children and said, I have not found a faith, even in you who are my chosen. What you going to do when Jesus show up in here and say, I ain't found no faith in here like I found out there. You know what I learned? Some people go through some things to get closer to God. And some people can't go through things because God knows you ain't strong enough to handle it. <laughs> I'm going to give a testimony. I don't know if he's listening on social media, and I'm going to call his name because he shared something with me last Sunday when he was here, when the class of 89, Wilma Hutchins, was here. The man walked up to me and hugged me after service, and he said to me, he said, you don't even know who I am, do you? And I looked at him, and I said, now, your face looks familiar, and I know you're a class of 89, but I cannot call your name. He says, my name is Cleveland Jones. And I looked at him, and I thought about it. I said, I remember you. He said, yeah. He said, I said, well, you look good. How have you been, and where have you been? He said, I've been incarcerated for 25 years. Been incarcerated for 25 years. I said, well, that will preserve one. I said, but if you don't mind me asking, what did you do? And he said, I did absolutely nothing. He said, I was with somebody. I don't know what they were planning on doing. We were hanging out together, and I considered him a friend. And he got out of the car, and he robbed some people. And I didn't know he was going to rob nobody. We ain't talked about it. If I had known, I never would have got in the car with it. But he got into some trouble, and I did 25 years on what somebody else did. I did absolutely nothing. But you know what his next statement was? But God is good. And I had to look at myself, this church baby. I don't know if I would have been strong enough to do 25 years for something I did not do. I don't know if I could still be with God if he allowed me to suffer 25 years of torment like that. Some people can go through some things in order to get closer to God that you can't go through because he knows that you can't handle it. And he shared with me, he said, you don't know how many people that I met in the last 25 years were just like me. Down there, some of them got life sentences, and some have died down there and hadn't done a thing because they didn't have adequate representation and because society had put a decree on the lives of some of our men and say, I'm going to put them in jail and throw away the key. I don't care if they're guilty or innocent. We just want to get rid of them and get them off the streets. And there are some down there hadn't done a thing. But I want to ask the question, could you handle it? This centurion soldier living a life that some of us in the church can't handle. But he's showing that even though my life ain't the one that's a flowery bed of e, I still can recognize Jesus. Faith from the unexpected. The ones you think will give up. And, and, and it's not that they'll give up. What you're really saying is if it had been you, you would have gave up. Some of us in here today, you know if too much pressure hits you now. You'll forget everything you ever learned in a Sunday school, a Bible study, any sermon ever preached. See, you can run around here and jump and holler and praise God and everything is good because you really can't handle pressure. But don't get mad and I ain't picking on you. Just be thankful that God knows his children and he only puts you in a situation that you can handle. But what you ought to do is instead of criticizing those who are out there, be thankful that God is out there with them and God 
God is able to hold them and keep them in their right mind. God is able to bring them out of the hands of the enemy. And God will have testimony, not just in here, but out there too. Somebody out there is still singing Amazing Grace. Somebody out there is still singing, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Somebody out there is still singing, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. But the mark of a servant out there is that he will not condemn those who are in here. That's why I shared with you that this soldier has said, I helped build the synagogue. I ain't got nothing against them. I just can't hang out there. I've got another calling on my life. But Jesus said, and I say unto them that there shall come from, there sh many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Get that kingdom of heaven. And he said they will sit down with them. Can I tell you why the, the Bible describes it? It says sit down. That shows that when, when you ever you sit down, that means you plan to stay. When you stand up, and it talks about standing up, that is a position of movement, or going forward, backward, east, west, whatever you want to call it. But when the Bible tells us that he, when we sit down, that means that I'm staying there. I'm holding my position. And God has said there will be people from north, south, east, and west that will come to the kingdom from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and will sit down with him. And I said the kingdom of heaven. But watch what it says in the very next verse. He says, but to the sons of the kingdom, not kingdom of heaven, not kingdom of God. He says, but to the sons of the kingdom, you shall be cast out into outer darkness where there'll be weeping and, and uh, there shall be gashing of teeth. Now, I've been in church all my life, and I still preach the same old thing. Salvation is secure, and it is complete. Once you got it, you can't get rid of it. But I noticed something in the text. It says that there will be many that will come from all directions and will sit in the kingdom of heaven with God. But now when it starts talking about the sun, it only says that they'll be sitting in the kingdom. And those will be cast out into other darkness where there will be ga weeping and gashing of teeth. We read of weeping and gashing of teeth, and you know where that is, don't you? That is a place that, another place that you don't have to pay for, but you can get free of charge too. And it's not the free gift of God. It's not for salvation and deliverance up. It's for deliverance down. That is, that's where I ever read about this weeping and gashing of teeth. But it says that the sons of the kingdom shall be cast out. Can I share with you something that might trouble you or scare you, but it ought to scare you closer to Christ instead of away from Christ? Can I tell you what I see here in the text? In the text where it says those will be sons in the kingdom he's talking about folks in the church Amen. and I ain't talking about the body of Christ he's talking about sons in the church that's why he just says kingdom not kingdom of heaven not kingdom of God not the heaven on high not the congregation of the body of believers I mean the the, the church body of believers he said the sons of the kingdom let me bust somebody's bubble there are some that have come to church and have had children that were born into the church, just like me, have been in church all of their lives, and they feel like because I've been in church all of my life that I'm a part of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. No, baby, you just part of the kingdom. You just a church person. You just been coming to church all of your life. And can I tell you something else that might be a shock to you, but it's a truth to you also. Mama and daddy, just because they brought you to church every day, that's not going to get you into the kingdom of heaven nor into the kingdom of God. You will sit here all your life thinking that you, uh, you've you been protected and you've been covered by blood and you got it all under control. But until you make Jesus your choice, sooner or later time is going to come and show you that you will be cast out into darkness and it's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In other words, when you get out there and see that God, you have not accepted Christ, it's going to be hard. You're going to cry and you're going to grit your teeth. But can I tell you something? Before you even go, to that, go through that, can I tell you, make a choice. But those shall be cast out into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gassing of teeth. 
Then the scripture 13 says, And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And this servant was healed in the very same hour. Two things in here. But one thing I want to share with you. I notice in the text that after this man had shown that he had a relationship with God and he was a believer of Jesus Christ and not one who has frequented in the church, I noticed that Jesus in red letter writing did not invite him to go to church. You would think that Jesus would say, go on, stop, stop, stop being upset. I know things ain't right in the church, but go anyhow. <laughs> Dang what he said. Matter of fact, the first words out of his mouth was go. Not go to church. Not go to the revival. Not even go down to the altar. Go your thy way. You know who thy is, don't you? Go thy way. Don't worry about the church house. God has said, let me take care of the church house. You keep doing what you're doing. And some people are saying, how can this preacher sit up here and tell folks that they don't need to go to church? If you're doing the work of the Lord, you ain't got to go to church. The church is already in you. Let me throw something in here for free. God has children that he will send to the church house. They will worship in the church house. But God also has children that will worship in the streets. And you don't need a whole bunch of street worshipers in the church house. You need church worshipers. See, y'all sing good. You pray good. You learn well. You discipline. You sit down and do what you're supposed to do the way you're supposed to do it, when you're supposed to do it, sometimes. But that's where God has placed you. But those that are going out on the battlefield, usually those that fight the battle, let's, let's, let's look at war. Usually those that get out and fight, you got some that are what we call Twitter fight with your fingers. They fight that way. But you got some that will roll up their sleeves and get out on the battlefield. Same way about Christians. There are some that will roll up their sleeves. And some of them will go get folks out of rehab. Some of them will go get people from out from under the bridge. Some of them will deal with people that are white collar criminals. Those that they have the ability to get God to people in places that a lot of us just aren't built to go. Amen. Let me throw something else in there to help you out. Do you know why God sent some folks to the church house? He sends you here to take care of the church house. <laughs> That's why we have such a great argument. They taking them people in that church house and taking up all of that money. Y'all going to sleep on them, but you're going to wake up after a while. <laughs> they taking up all that money and they doing all that. You know why it's done in the church house? Because in the church house... That is our greatest work and our uh, greatest weapon of choice to fight for the army of the living God. See, we know how to use money to do what's necessary in the world. Right. See, we ain't taking up no whole bunch of money to have a whole lot of money. We take up a whole lot of money so we can help those that don't have no money. Those out in the world are reaching people. They're in the same condition. A lot of them are not rich. And don't you know that you ought to help those who are out there on the battlefield for the Lord? Sometimes they come in here and give you a testimony as to what's happening. And then we bless them financially so they can keep on with their journey. We've had many who have come and testified that how they have led people to Christ. And what do you do for those? You lend them money and so that they can keep on in their journey and keep on going. See, the church folks, you ain't bad, and those outside ain't bad, but we've got to learn how to work together. 
But the devil got us fighting one another. You don't come to church, and I ain't going to help you, and you ain't going to help me, and I know God, and no, you don't know God, and, and I know God because I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, and y'all ain't doing what y'all supposed to do, and you never realize God has strategically placed all of us in a certain position so that we can work together and glorify and honor God. Ain't nothing wrong with singing and praying in here, but you ought not to discredit those who won't come in here and sing and praise God. You ought to be thankful those who are working out there in us. In other words, you ought to thank God that he's omniscient and he's omniscient. God has all power and God has all presence. He's both places at the same time. That's why this centurion soldier in his text, he's, in the, he's written into the word of God. But you don't see him criticizing those who are in the church and not doing what he's supposed to do. Whenever he gets a chance, he lends to them as well. But we've got to learn in the church to lend to them also. Well, if you didn't shout, that's your own fault. Because I'm through now. But can I tell you about somebody that I met in the church house? I met a man named Jesus in the church house. When daddy was preaching about this man, I found out who he was. And when mama was plunking on the piano, she was playing about this man that I longed to know. But can I tell you where he was? He was outside the church building. Because when I looked for him, I didn't hardly see him as clear as I could until I got outside of the church building. When I got outside of the church building, I got some lumps on my head. I got some bruises on my back. And then when I got beat down and broke down and I kneeled down, guess who I looked up to? I looked up to a man named Jesus who went up on a hill called Calvary. And when I saw him going up on a hill called Calvary, he had some knots on his head and some bruises on his back and some scars on him. And they had wrapped the crown of thorns around his head. I said, it looks like they're treating him just like he's treating me. He said, you're right, son, because everything you see on me is supposed to be on you. But can I tell you one thing? Just keep on following me till I get up on Calvary. When he got up on Calvary's hill, he said that they're doing this to me because of sin and shame and I said well I got some shame in my life and I've got some sin in my life he said I know because the shame you looking at and the sin you looking at is yours son then I start to wonder, how can this man tell me about myself? And he's in all of this suffering. Look like he ought to be wanting to save himself. But for some reason, I wanted to tell him, get down off of that cross and save yourself and come down and tell me a little bit more. He said, no, son, you'll learn more about me on the cross than you will off the cross. I've got to stay on the cross. I say, but you up on that cross bearing my sin and my shame. And they're bruising you and they're gambling for your clothes. And it should have been me. Why would you do that? He said, I'm glad you asked. Because the Bible teaches that for God so loved you, Galen, that he gave his only begotten son, that whomsoever believeth him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That made me hunger for him a little more. I said, now you mean to tell me that you've got to die so that I might live? He said, yes, son. Now you're getting the point across. I've got to die in order for you to live because I know that you can't die because you don't have what I have in me. I said, well, what do you have? He said, I'm going to get up on the third day and when I get up, look at my hands, son. I've got all power of heaven and earth in my hands. And I said, you got all power? I said, well, can I have some? He said, son, you can have all power. All you have to do is confess with your mouth that I'm the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that my God Father has raised me from the dead. All power of heaven and earth shall be granted unto you. The Lord is sharing with us that he has salvation for all in all places at all times. Trust him. Believe him. Look for faith in unexpected situations. You ought to see some faith in people that don't look like us. Don't wear ties and suits like us. Don't have to dress up to come to worship. But come to worship because I'm toe up. Come to worship because I've been torn down. 
I've been battered and bruised and scorned, but I'm still on the battlefield. Come to worship because God has something for me. Quit talking about what you're bringing to him. I give him my all, and, and, I, and you won't even get your hands dirty for him. Amen.